Good afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure to open today's uh, Provost Lecture Series, which will be given by uh, Professor Evan Economo, who is also the Dean of Faculty Affairs. Uh, so this is very, a very special occasion because Evan is leaving uh, very soon, moving to the U.S., and so he will be the department chair at, uh, I don't remember the name, but um, University of Maryland, East Coast of the U.S. And uh, so Professor Nick Shannon will be chairing today's session, so I will hand the floor over to you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I feel this is a bit of a sad honor to introduce Evan as he is both on his victory lap and taking his leave of us. There are a lot of people here for whom Evan really doesn't need any introduction, but I'm conscious that particularly the people who've joined since the start of the pandemic may have not had the chance to get to know him as well as, as some of the rest of us. So I'd like to take a few minutes of your time just to introduce Evan and orientate you to some of the things that he has done. So Evan was born in Canada, raised in the US, and educated at the University of Arizona. And I feel some pride to say that he started out as a physicist, though he saw some great opportunities in other subjects and quickly defected. Uh, he then completed a PhD at the University of Austin, Texas in 2009, where I think he also developed some interest in barbecue. And he joined OIST in 2011, or 2012 properly, I guess, as an assistant professor. Now, uh, if you join OIST as a mid-career professor, like me, it can be a humbling experience, because when you put together people with this level of talent, with OIST's level of resources, some pretty amazing things can follow. I was tipped off by Jonathan Dorfen, that he thought he'd recruited a good one, one I should watch out for. And I will give you a few kind of bare facts to illustrate this. So um, Evan's CV, which I got from his website, <laughs> uh, lists 130-some publications and a book, The Ants of Fiji. Uh, he has won, I won't read him out, by embarrass him by reading out all the prizes he's won, but quite a lot of won including one for top 10 new species, which was not a new thing I knew that there was a prize for. Uh, he has supervised, I think, 10 PhD students at OIST, about 20 rotation students, 30 interns. These are just numbers, but if you think it each is a, a person, it starts to add up. And he's also, and this I think everybody's aware of, completed an enormous amount of university service for OIST, even before he became the Dean of Faculty Affairs. Evan was on practically every committee in OIST, including the big ones, things like the Space Allocation Committee, the Curriculum and Examination Committee, the Appointments and Promotions Committee. Uh, and as, as Dean, of course, he was on the Executive Committee. He was also, if any of you got into a situation that needed conflict resolution, the Associate Ombudsman for some years. Happily, I never met him in that capacity. So, an extremely accomplished guy. Whoops, I've gone slightly too far. I said I wouldn't embarrass him by reading out the prizes, but maybe the most recent is, is worth mentioning. So, uh, he, the, he was the winner, the national winner of the Frontiers Prize um, for um, his work on modeling ecosystems has had a fellowship at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. And I think he would be quick to point to the large team that he built up and who worked very successfully on those projects. And I would kind of point back at him for being smart and realizing that this was exactly the right thing to do at OIST and having led that team so well. He also founded Okeon, which has gone on from strength to strength. Uh, he was, his lab was always very popular with visitors you might think somebody that successful couldn't possibly have a sense of humor, but the choice of names for some of the ants suggests otherwise. Um, he did find time for a family, including a dog. <laughs> the dog has another home now. And early Oist was, a, was actually a very sociable place. It was turbulent at times. Uh, Startups uh, sometimes are. 
Uh, but there were also a lot of parties and a lot of time spent and quite a few parties held at Evan and Juanita's house. Some of those people you will recognize. We look younger. Uh, and some of you will know this already, and some of you may not. Evan's also a really good cook. Uh, and in particular, I'm not sure if it was Texas or some native inclination that was there before. He is very skilled in cooking meats by primitive methods. <laughs> we we co-owned for a while this, this large, sinister black smoker that you can see in the top left corner, which we bought from somebody who was moving back from Texas, and Evan raised to a high art cooking various meats and, and things that I hadn't even thought of doing, like uh, curing bacon and then, and then smoking that. So that was pretty good. Um, he also clearly has the ability to multitask. <laughs> now, I, I couldn't find in the old photos anything else that spoke so clearly to the potential to become Dean of Faculty Affairs, but looking after multiple human beings at the same time must surely be an important qualification for that. Okay, I'm going to get out of the way now because it's, it's definitely not me that you've come to see. Um, Evan, it's been great having you here. I'm sad you're leaving. I'm sure everybody is. Um, but please uh, come and take your bow before the crowd. Well, thank you, uh, Amy, so much for the invitation to come to this uh, uh, provost, give a provost lecture, and thank you also to Nick for the very kind introduction. Okay, so, so yeah, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the research we've been doing over the years here in my lab, in our lab at OIST. Um, but just first, I, I do want to say, as Nick said, I came here early on, and um, actually this is something like what it looked like here when I came on my interview, uh, actually there was less of Lab 2, and I gave my, I remember giving my job talk in this actual room, uh, and everyone was, the few who came were extremely exhausted, because I think we hired about 25 faculty in that year. Um, so it was uh, quite, quite a, so I slipped through that way. That was, um, and also this is what my first lab group uh, looked like, lab photo, and uh, I think about you know, where I was at when I came here that so long ago, and, and I've really grown tremendously in, in all ways as a scientist and in many different ways since I've been here. Um, except for physically, I've just deteriorated. But, uh, <laughs> um, but every other way, it's been good. Um, okay, so, so now to get into the science, I, I'm going to sort of zoom out a little more than I normally do in my usual seminar, but want to give you a little, a little frame about what people in our field of biodiversity science do and uh, what we're trying to, to answer. And really, it goes back to this early golden age of, of explorers and uh, Humboldt and Banks who really got out there around the world and explored the world and they found lots of interesting things and thought it would be a good idea to save them and study them and, and categorize them. And of course, uh, Linnaeus uh, first sort of put in the formal system of categorizing nature. And that left in its wake uh, what we call you know, natural history collection. So lots of accumulated information about, uh, about life out there uh, on the earth. And th this is, forms the basis for most of our research in our lab are these collections. And so we, we study biodiversity, and bio, uh, you know, is, of course, life. And, and a, as people looked at all these different organisms, it became, you know, obvious that one of the most interesting thing, things about them were, were, were their differences, were the varieties we see out there uh, in nature in, in all different ways. And, and, tr and categorizing, we can measure that diversity, we can model that diversity, and trying to understand where it came from and what shapes the patterns and diversity we find around the world. That's the, the foundation of biodiversity science. And right now, there's uh, actually unprecedented interest in biodiversity in the broader societal sphere. I mean, compared to, let's say, 10 years ago, there's far more discussion of, of the biodiversity crisis. You know, we're in actually a dual crisis. We have the climate crisis. But even if we were to solve that tomorrow, we would still have a biodiversity crisis to deal with. And there's all kinds of increasing conventions and, and, and legal frameworks and interest in biodiversity and even lots of money 
uh, uh, 70 billion you know, US dollars a year goes into biodiversity finance, biodiversity related programs and, and uh, debt relief and everything. And you know, while that's all great, I also, as a biodiversity scientist, sort of have this feeling that we still lack a lot of the fundamental data and knowledge that underlies that and that you know, we scientists haven't fully done our job to provide society with the base knowledge we need to save biodiversity and to understand it the way we need to. And a big part of that missing, missing uh, data, this is one of my favorite quotes, but to a first approximation, all animals are insects, okay? So over 75% of described animal species are insects. And you know, we, we know, you know we're, we're missing huge amounts of fundamental knowledge across many, many species. And of course, many species not described at all, so probably that percentage is much higher. Um, so you know, what we actually need to do to, uh, to sort of uh, lay a foundation of data, lay a foundation of knowledge across all different groups of life is what I call bedrock data. You know, for the next 100 years of biodiversity science, we want to build data uh, in some fundamental you know, axes for life, so geography, where are species uh, located around the world, the phenotype, the, 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 the shape, the everything about its anatomy and physiology. I would put phylogeny and systematics, how we categorize species and how they're related to each other, and also genomes, and you could add a few more onto that. But these are kind of the base layers upon which, uh, you know, we can build our science and also our understanding for society. So how can we put together these kinds of data? It's a huge challenge for all of these groups that are not very well uh, studied. But we also have a lot of exciting new tools and approaches coming online, things that we all have heard a lot about, you know, big data resources, um, artificial intelligence, uh, you know, the democratization of model organism tools. We can do things to species far be that we only used to be able to do to Drosophila and also new ways to interact with information. So if I were to describe kind of what we're trying to do, I mean, retroactively, this isn't how I thought about it going out, but what we're trying to do in our lab is, is take some of these new tools and new approaches and, and go back to that same kind of project that was started 300 years ago, uh, which is trying to organize life, uh, document life, and then understand life. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about a few uh, big categories of this. Uh, and particularly as we applied them to, to arthropod biodiversity. Uh, first, the, the global view of diversity and conservation, so mapping the geography of life. Uh, how do we track change? How do we track arthropod populations and communities in the Anthropocene? And then finally, how do we illuminate the ecology and evolution of phenotypes? So I'll start with that. Um, so this is a really fundamental question. One of those things that when you think about it is kind of crazy we don't know um, in a time when we can, de we can image fields of galaxies, you know, 14 billion light years away, you know, we don't really know where the majority of Earth's species are on the, on the globe. We don't know, we can't map their range. Ideally, we want something like this, a map of where each species can be found and in the aggregate where are those really important areas for conservation? Where do we have clusters of species that have very small ranges or are very threatened uh, due, due, to, uh, due to development? Um, and actually, we do have this kind of data for vertebrates. So for amphibians, birds, mammals, reptiles, we have pretty complete data on, or at least reasonably complete, of where each species is found. We have a range map. Uh, but that's only 4% of known species, right? So 96% of known animal species is, are invertebrates. And this is a problem because all of those, uh, all that effort to go into conservation is based on these data, based on where vertebrates are, and maybe to some degree plants, but is missing huge amounts of uh, diversity that are extremely important for, for running the world. So when the big project we've been doing in our lab for really since I got here is what we call the Global Ant Biodiversity Informatics Project. It's trying to build up ants as an exemplar group where we have that kind of comprehensive data and comprehensive picture in the same way we have birds, amphibians, or mammals. And people, you know, they often ask, well, why ants? Why do you work on ants? Well, actually, you know, the, the first answer is it, it's, it's not about the ants per se, 
they are, you know, they're a representative or an exemplar of all these other invertebrates that are out, that are out there. They're a place to start. Of course, they are extremely fascinating too, and that drives a lot of us in our lab, and that's one reason why we have so much more data on ants than we do other, other groups, because they're extremely uh, interesting. They're one of the dominant groups around the world in terms of what, you know, what are the animals that dominate our planet. Ants are up there high in the, in the list, and uh, they have all kinds of interesting behaviors and social structures and everything else. But really, you know, I want you to keep in mind, this, it's an exemplar for that we can kind of blaze a trail with ants that we can apply to other groups. And uh, many people have been involved with this, many other projects, I won't go through them all, but especially the research I'm gonna show in the next slides is those uh, uh, heavily uh, coming from those four people on the top, some people you may remember. Um, and so when we think about vertebrates, you know, it's really a different kind of problem to map biodiversity for vertebrates than it is for invertebrates. So with vertebrates, we have a huge number of scientists and amateurs from thinking about each species, looking for each species, and mapping each species. And just as, as an example, eBird, this, this online platform, uh, you know, generates millions of data points per week on where species are around the world, where ant species. So in one week, they're generating more, more data points uh, on birds that have ever in 300 years been generated for ants. So it's a totally different scale of data. So for, our, uh, for invertebrates, we have to do it differently. We can't just do that same thing. We have to take a much more sparse data set, uh, a much more fragmented data set, and use computational methods and different techniques to try to uh, you know, weave together something coherent. And it really, you know, we have to address a series of problems as we approach this. And you know, the problem one is data are scattered in obscure literature, museum collections, and databases. So there has been a lot of data accumulated over the years, but it's in really obscure publications. Um, and so you know, I would, I'd love to say we had some great algorithms that went through and scrubbed all this, but actually what we did was you know, we hired some assistants and we, I, we enlisted the, the lab and we got together over 10,000 papers in, from 25 different languages and we read them, and then we got the data out and did digitize it. And to that, we got together museum collections, online databases, uh, and all kinds of other things. And altogether, we have about 2.5 million records. So the second problem is that data are often incomplete, ambiguous, or lack coordinates. So anything that was collected before the 80s usually will lack a latitude and longitude. So it'll have something like this. This is one of Darwin's specimens that he collected on, from Tierra del Fuego. And you'll see, you know, it's got this kind of scribbled text. It'll say a few things. Maybe we kind of know where it is, but we, we don't really know exactly where in the world that, that specimen is from. So to address this, of course, the first step is we, we can kind of group them by larger area, by polygon. But to really get into high resolution mapping, we have to try to uh, add a point. So to this, um, uh, we spent quite a long time building a computational pipeline to do what's called georeferencing, trying to fix all kinds of errors in the data, uh, impute missing fields. Um, you know, so when there's gaps in the data, can we figure out what is there? Use geocoders to predict location. So the same way you type into Google Maps some fragments of things that can kind of guess usually where you're trying to go. It's sort of similar to that. Actually, one of the most important tools we used is sort of the back end of Google uh, a geocoder. Predict points when there are none, so if there is no point, where could that be? And also, um, you know, reverse geocode, check to see what the point we have matches the, the text and identify errors and, and inconsistencies. So this is very much a, an informatics problem we have to solve. But as you can see, after doing that, we have way more points and also much more uh, uh, di distributed around the world because the collecting in the last 30 years has been very concentrated to certain places around the world. Um, so I don't know if Kenneth is here, but he really did a lot of the work on that, uh, Kenneth Dudley. Okay, um, so once you have points, you need to take those points and turn them into species di di distribution. So we use a technique called automated species di di distribution modeling, uh, such as Maxan. I won't go into the details, but we've had several experts here uh, at OIST over the years in this. So what we do is right, do automated modeling over 15,000 species to try to get a model of each species uh, range. 
And from that, you can, you know, after many, many years of work, you can put it together and get something like this. So on the top is a map of ant species richness. Where are there more species uh, found in the world? Where are the most species found in the world? And then on the bottom, rarity. So that's something we're really interested in conservation, concentrations of species with very small ranges. Where are the small ranged species on the planet, okay? Because those are the ones that we think are going to be especially important to, for conservation, for example. So how does this compare with vertebrates? Well, you can see the ant, uh, uh, so we're now looking at the top 10% area in these uh, different axes. So speed, really richness and rarity, the top 10% of area in the world. The, um, the red are the ant uh, uh, hotspots, if you will. And the gray are all the different accumulated vertebrate groups. And you can see there's quite a bit of uh, uh, overlap, but also some important differences between them. I won't take you through every detail in the map. But you know, we have another problem, and that is that sampling around the globe is very incomplete. We haven't explored everywhere in the globe equally you know, through some obvious things like where the universities are located, but also uh, idiosyncratic things. We have a collector who spent their career sampling one place in the world in the tropics uh, for ants, but not other things. So we have to actually model this and try to fix our map and try to uh, overcome this. So uh, we, you know, in this recent study, we use the machine learning method, uh, random forest, to try to predict the impact of future sampling. We tried to model and say, if we were to explore, you know, we do know where we have explored. So that's an important bit of information, but we can build a model on where the hotspots are located based on all kinds of biotic and abiotic variables, but also how much we sampled each place. And then we can make a prediction on if we were to explore the world evenly, what would the map look like? What are those gaps that we're missing? Um, so, yeah, I'll talk about that in a, in a, in a minute. But the, the, you know, how well do vertebrate patterns predict ant biodiversity patterns? That's a key question for conservation. I said that we're organizing our conservation around, uh, around vertebrate data. You know, how well does it predict all these other groups? What we found is that it actually, uh, after you do this correction for sampling, um, there's moderate overlap with high richness centers, so areas that have more species. But that metric that's really important for conservation, you know, about 80% overlap between ver vertebrates and ants, which is actually quite good news for area-based conservation, that those areas that we're protecting for vertebrates are likely to capture uh, many invertebrates. But each group has its important differences, has some areas that are very important that are not found in others. So, you know, why is this relevant? I mean, you may have heard that there's a goal on a very high levels uh, to protect 30% of Earth's area by 2030. This is called uh, 30 by 30. Um, and other efforts like it try to, you know, protect large swaths of the globe. Well, we need to make sure that we're protecting areas where biodiversity is concentrated. So actually only, no matter what taxonomic group or what uh, metric you're looking at, only 15 to 25% of these biodiversity uh, uh, centers have any protection right now. So it's very important to have this, this kind of data or else we're protecting uh, potentially the wrong areas. But more generally, what this gives us is a, uh, uh, what I like to call a biodiversity tre treasure map. So what we're plotting here is the red areas are areas that, that look like they're biodiversity centers, but we think it may be because I mean, they're important areas, but they're not in the top 10% of the world only because they've been oversampled. Um, the purple areas, if we were to explore the world more completely, we think they will maintain their status in the top 10%. Um, but the blue areas are areas of what you might call hidden diversity, so where we don't identify them as hotspots, but we think if we were to explore them, then we uh, will find many unknown species and many small range species. So that gives us a treasure map, if you will, of where to go and look for new diversity. And just to give you an example, you know, we were a bit surprised to see, although it made sense in retrospect, that the, the, the tropical Andes, the central and southern tropical Andes, don't show up as a hot spot for ants. They're in that blue color, but they are predicted to be. For almost every other group, they have many, many small range species there. So that tells us we need to go and devote our effort to sampling there and uh, test this model and see. So, uh, and just as a bit of an aside, you know, in case you're curious, 
you know, Okinawa and the Ryukus show up in the top 10 percent of biodiversity areas in the world, um, even given the differences in sampling. And that's because we have restricted species here on the island, spe species that only occur in a very small area in the world. Most species that would be in, say, mainland Asia have a very, very wide distribution. So we live in one of these biodiversity hotspots. So where do I see this right now? I mean, this was actually the, the cover of the, 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 went along with this article, but I show it because um, it sort of represents where, you know, this uh, map is a copper engraving of what we knew about the world in 1600s. And if you look at it closely, there's all kinds of things askew and, and there's biases. There's areas we know quite well and areas that are more gaps in the map. But those maps were very important for uh, uh, early exploration to sort of guide us in where to go in a more systematic way and sort of accumulate knowledge we have around the world and we could iterate on it, iterate on it, and each map got better and better. And that's where I think we are for, for biodiversity for ants and I think to different degrees all these other groups. We have a, a skewed model, we have some idea where we need to look more, but we need to, to iterate, you know, more field work uh, with these kind of predictive models. So actually have a model running of where we need to explore in the world, test that model, and iteratively improve it. So that's something I'm really going to be trying to explore going forward is how do we in integrate this whole feedback loop. So of course, you know, we don't do that, do the, the, this kind of mapping just for its own sake. I just am not going to go through all these studies, but um, once you have that base layer of biodiversity, you can answer all kinds of interesting, both basic and applied questions about biodiversity. So this map of life allows us to understand large-scale diversification, where this diversity came from and how it's being regulated. Um, these are just some of the studies over the years. And also track the global spread and impact of uh, introduced species. So these are species that are being brought around the world by accident by humans and causing all kinds of damage and, and causing all kinds of problems. Um, we, you know, when you have this global data, we, we, we can analyze it along with other large-scale groups, and that's been a big focus of our lab over the years, is pursuing all these questions with it. So one last aside, uh, you know, that we also uh, may built this um, uh, interactive website, Ant Maps, if you want to check it out. That's one thing that I think a lot of people, uh, at least in the ant world, find OIST through this because it's used by about 4,000, we have about 4,000 hits a day of people coming to get information about uh, where ants occur in the world. So you can go and interact with the database and look at all the citations behind every record. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next uh, part of the talk. So, you know, this, if we have some version of a map of life, we also want to have some kind of a, a map of change. We want to know what's happening to biodiversity in the current era. How is it changing over time? Um, and that's an even harder problem, right? So we're trying to get one snapshot. How, how do we actually track uh, over time? And this has particularly gotten a lot of attention in the last few years because there was a study in 2017 by an uh, amateur entomological society in Germany who had been sampling insects uh, over uh, several decades and found uh, a pretty dramatic decline in the biomass of insects. And there's this sort of general, that, that touched a nerve because a lot of people I think, at least, that you know, when you drive around your car, you get fewer insects on your windshield now than when we were kids. Memory is a bit imperfect, but you know, this, this led to a, uh, a, a sort of a global story uh, about called the insect apocalypse so that's still being talked about. Or insect declines are a major thing. You may have seen it in the, in the news, and it's been in you know, both research and the public media. And what this underscore, however, the, the sort of science on which this is based is rather spotty and rather uh, unclear. And, and a big part of the reason is we don't have a lot of long-term data in ecology uh, on what's happening to, we don't have a weather system to track biodiversity in the same way we do climate, right? We can't say what's happened to insects in Okinawa in the last 50 years because we don't have that data. So that was one of the motivations to start the, the, this project with many, many colleagues at OIST, Okian, the Okian Shuramori project. And this was to set up a, a long-term uh, environmental monitoring system in Okinawa. So we, we put on, we you know, stood up 24 sites around the island. Each site has a collection of different instruments and, uh, and uh, sampling uh, technologies. And the real goal is to track what's happening to Okinawa in the long term across many different dimensions of, of ecology. So 
in 30 years from now, we, we can say what's happening to insects in Okinawa. We will know that. We'll be one of the only places in the world where we can say that. And of course, a big part of this, you know, say half of the reason we did this was to get out there and actually have contact with people in the, on the island and make connections around the island. So we worked quite a lot with high schools and also museums. Uh, and these activities have continued over the years. And it's been um, a good way for OIST to get out there and, and be visible in Okinawa and show that we're doing research relevant to Okinawa. So we, of course, track uh, insects. We do, uh, uh, we're doing med med metabarcoding and other methods and also monitor for the spread of uh, invasive species. I'll, I'll show you just some data uh, in that from a study we recently did. Um, we, it's too soon to do long-term trend data, but we can look at sort of dynamics, seasonal dynamics, and some other kinds of dynamics happening on the island. And the question we said was, well, if we look at how, how uh, not the diversity, but the vari variability in the activity of all a bunch of different species of ants, all the different species of ants, how does that vary over the year? And how does that change along this di disturbance gradient? You can see from north to south in Okinawa, we go from pretty intact forest all the way to urban and our sites straddle that. And just in a nutshell, what we found is that actually we have uh, many more ants outside the forest in Okinawa. They're not necessarily the ants you want to have, so it's not necessarily a good thing. I'm sure many of you don't think it's a good thing. But uh, um, many, many ants outside the forest uh, uh, and fewer ants abundance inside the forest. But the variability is far, far higher inside the forest. So actually, we thought it might be that outside the forest, everything's going kind of wild but actually the variability is, is much higher in the forest. And when we looked into that, we found that um, there's a fairly straightforward explanation, and that is that seasonality is far, far stronger inside the forest. So what actually breaks, so here we're, we're looking at all the Okeon sites and the heat map over two years of data. So the red is more ants and the, and the, and the blue is, is fewer ants. But basically, the fluctuations of all the species in Okinawa are far more synchronized inside the forest than they are outside the forest, where you see a lot more differences. So the, the net total of that lack of synchronization is um, a more constant uh, activity outside the forest. So the thing that's really broken down in Okinawa uh, with the lack of forest cover is the seasonal patterns in the, in the communities so far. There, this is just another plot where we've you know, statistically pulled out the seasonal signal you can see much more, each line is a different species, much more overlapping from the forested sites rather than the disturbed sites. So going along with that, uh, another big project that, that came, I started with Okeana, came out of Okeana, came out of uh, Okeana is a very applied project, which is trying to uh, track the, the, the spread of, or actually not the spread, monitor for the arrival for uh, the red-ed ported fire ant. And some of you who've been here a while may, may remember, I call this, you know, the 2017 fire ant crisis. You know, I put crisis in quotes because actually it went a little bit more than even I would say is warranted to where uh, it was on the news all the time. So these ants started showing up in ports around mainland Japan uh, in 2017, and it became on the news every night. That's uh, the Prime Minister Abe having a press conference about the fire ant situation, um, and it was... Uh, uh, became almost a bit of a hysteria where people didn't want to leave their house and all this because there might be fire ants. Um, and, uh, and so actually it, it became a, 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 you know, people were look, look, looking around and who knows about fire ants. And we had already started a fire ant monitoring program here with the OPG in Okinawa. And it became through actually the efforts, tireless efforts of CPR uh, and Tomomi, I don't know if she's here, but uh, uh, Tomomi Akubo especially, to you know, promote that we well we know something about this here, and we're actually doing this kind of monitoring surveillance, and uh, and uh, several of our staff members were on TV all the time. So uh, I mention this really just to show that it became a good story for Oist because uh, it showed that we're everyone can understand that what we're doing here is to try to help Okinawa if we're trying to keep some bad thing that's named after fire out of the you know out of the ecosystem here. So. Um, so yeah, that was a, a, a nice thing. Uh, just another, you know, almost like a, a, a pitch, I guess, for one other kind of data we've been co collecting is sound over time. Uh, so this is a visualization of uh, index, sound in, in, index uh, around the 24-hour clock, and then from in to out is through time. 
but only recently through you know some people in the the section and a former staff scientist uh, uh, Nick Friedman you know they're, they're, they're the tools to actually analyze the, this big sound data and in particular identify all the birds in there we used to have to build the the uh, the models one by one but there are some sort of con consolidated tools you know big companies like Google are getting into this and now we're, we're kind of poised to crack open a lot of this, this data and analyze it. And this is a massive data set, 800 million occurrences of birds, according to Nick, um, that you, you can detect out of these recordings. So a um, huge amount of data that's hard to even, even analyze. So if any of you out there are interested in time series analysis, uh, there's a really good data. And, and yeah, just a shout out also to Sam Ross, who you see his name at the bottom, has done a lot of the work on this uh, over the years and pushed this forward. And, you know, just last thing about o Okeon, you know, one of the, I do hope we can figure out how to keep it going in some fashion. You know, one of the reasons there aren't these long-term data sets out there is because it's really hard to maintain in the long term in science when PhDs end and people move institution and everything else. So, uh, so it is uh, going to get more and more interesting, the data that we get out of there. Okay, so I want to move on to the last section. So... This is really about the phenotype. How can we, you know, I've, I've talked a lot about uh, species, but it's really, they're more than just dots on a map, you know, or lines on a graph, right? They have all kinds of interesting structure uh, to them and uh, that has function. And, you know, really the, the uh, organismal shape has kind of lagged behind uh, the big data era, uh, if you will, that has been you know, going through uh, biology in the last years. But there are you know, some analogous new technologies out there that can give you comprehensive data on the shape of an organism in the same way that you might get uh, that similar scale data from the genome of an or organism. And early on, we had always uh, decided to you know, purchase a micro CT. And that has really been an engine for, that's one of the tools out there that you can use to characterize the 3D structure of an organism. And that has been, you know, one of the, the, the pillars of our research over the years is, uh, is using this technique. And so to, to talk about ants a little bit, you know, ants, um, they're one of the most dominant species on Earth, as I have uh, are already said. And we often talk about the keys to their success, the sociality and how, what they can do working in groups, the, the division of labor. Uh, communication, their ecological and behavioral flexibility. They can get in almost any terrestrial habitat. But one that we focus on quite a lot in our lab is the wingless ant worker phenotype. And that is one of the key adaptations of ants was the loss of flight. So actually, th this is a wingless wasp. The ancestor of uh, ants are they're, they're part of a group of wasps. And um, they've lost the, the wing, and that led to a, when, once you remove the constraint of flight, it leads to a reorganization of the whole phenotype. Um, all kinds of different changes internally and externally that can optimize for ground labor. La labor. And that's thought to be one of the key things. And in, in our lab, I mean, I can't unfortunately talk about all these different things, but many people you may know from around OIST and many more that I can't put up there doing lots of different uh, projects on uh, different features of the ant phenotype, everything from locomotion to the brain and sensory systems uh, to the stinger and, uh, and, and more. But I'm just to give you an example, I'm going to tell you more about one that uh, we've been working on several projects, and that is the diversification of mandibles, so the evolution of mandibles. So ant mandibles are, are very interesting because, you know, well, we, we tend to think of a normal ant mandible lo looking like this, which we often call the ground plan. But that has been, you know, those mandibles have been modified into all kinds of different interesting and specialized tools, um, far beyond what almost any other group of insect has in terms of the diversity of their mandibles. Um, and so this is actually a, a composite that, that Julian made uh, from, our, from our lab. Uh, so Julian is doing his PhD on the diversity of mandibles. And these are the mandibles of, uh, of maybe a couple hundred different species of ants. And you can see that all kinds of different tools have evolved and different structures have evolved for different purposes. Um, so you can look, this, look at this in amorphous space. Um, so, so Julian has developed a landmark system that can kind of quantify the 3D shape of all these different uh, structures. And you can see that a lot of the more unusual I don't know if you can see that red in there, but this is a PC shape space. And this 
all, a lot of these more aberrant mandibles are uh, for associated with, with predation or specialized forms of predation. Um, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the evolution of one kind of specialized uh, mandible, and that is the trap jaw ant. So trap jaw ants have uh, evolved at least four times in distantly related groups of ants. Um, you can see, so this, that squiggly thing is the tree of life of ants, or the reeds from time into the outside. And then uh, what's colored red are the, uh, are the groups that have trap jaw mandibles. And really, the more technical term would be latch-mediated spring actuation. So it works more like, it works very much like a mousetrap. You know, so you're loading elastic energy into a spring, and there's some kind of latch mechanism that locks that spring and controls when it's released. And when it's released, it can produce, uh, uh, release power uh, 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 much more quickly, and therefore uh, generate speeds far beyond what normal biological muscle can, can generate. So that, that's called a power amplification mechanism. And we use power amplification in many different contexts in our own technology. Um, but so these have mandibles that have evolved to work like a, uh, um, like a mousetrap, essentially. So some, a little bit of natural history. So I'm going to talk about this one group, this big one down here, Strumogenes, where we've looked in a lot of detail to try to understand how this system has evolved. And um, so just a bit of natural history about Strumogenes. So they're one of the few hyperdiverse radiations of ants. So there's over 900 to, to describe species out there, probably another four or 500 that have not been described. If you go outside here and, and scrounge around the dirt, you can probably find some. They're right out here in Okinawa. Um, they're kind of leaf litter predators, a little bit like lions of the leaf litter. They kind of roam around and, and do, uh, um, but they're you know not to be feared because they're quite small. So that's what they look like uh, to scale of a human finger. Um, and uh, so another bit of background is that they are specialized, or they, their favorite food really is springtails. So springtails are other arthropods that have a spring-loaded escape mechanism. So they can jump like that, right? And so it's thought that this spring-loaded mouth is uh, an adaptation to help capture spring-loaded prey. So here you can just see an example. Boom, you know, the prey walks up and it, it, it uh, impales it on this uh, weapon and then lifts it up and stings it from un underneath. But when, and if you want to look in more detail what's happening inside the head, so it, the, the yellow are obviously the mandibles. Uh, this, uh, this green structure is like a lock, so it, it locks in between the mandibles. The mandibles will open wide, and the green stru structure locks them in the open position. That's the latch. Then the red color are, are the mandibles that close, oh, sorry, the muscles that close the mandible. It will pull and add strain onto the system. And then when it wants to release, um, this these green muscles will pull the latch out. And, um, and if you look underneath, there are some trigger hairs under there. So when it senses prey, it will uh, pull that latch out and the mandibles will close very quickly. Actually, I won't talk about it more, but it has some very interesting neurological adaptations too. There's a giant neuron that connects that, those trigger hairs directly to the muscle so it doesn't have to go through the brain and because uh, that's much slower if it has to go through the brain. Okay, so the interesting thing about this group for us is that about one-third of the species out there don't have this mandible system. So you know, we want to understand how did this thing evolve? How did this complex mechanism evolve? Um, Strumogenes are interesting because you know, there's hundreds out there that don't have this mechanism. They have a more typical um, mandible that they use to kind of grab onto prey and then hang on for dear life um, while they try to sting it. And, but about two-thirds have this long power amplified mandible. And there's a lot of variation around the world in forms. So we, we said, did a global project where we consolidated material around the world from museums and personal collections. Um, we sequenced uh, around 450 species uh, here at OIST in our sequencing center. Um, we CT scanned uh, variation across the tree of life, across this group, um, to try to characterize mandible structure across many different clades. And also our collaborators in Illinois did high-speed videography to measure you know, mandible kinematics, uh, actually to me me measure how fast this mandible is, is moving. So this is the, the phylogeny or the evolutionary tree of the, this group. So the ancestors up here and then over time is going from top to bottom. 
and you can see the branching re represents the diversification of this group. And all the, all the gray colors are the, um, are the sort of non-trap jaw gripping mandible, and the red colors are the trap jaw mandible. So the first thing you can notice here is that there's many different times this red color has ar arisen on this tree, which means that this phenotype has evolved many, many times around the world independently. And you can see there's a lot of fidelity to the, uh, the geographic region. So where, whereas we thought the trap jaw ants here in Okinawa may be related to the trap jaw ants in, in South America or Africa, actually what we're finding is that that phenotype evolved independently in all these different areas uh, at, uh, uh, rather than evolving once and spreading around the world. So over seven to ten times power amplified mandibles. But we also were sort of surprised that it, it's not just short mandible versus long mandible uh, uh, a dif difference. We also found a sort of hidden trap jaw phenotype, uh, whereas there was many there were some short mandibles that we hadn't recognized were actually trap jaws. They have a bear trap-like mandible uh, that has really long teeth. Um, so when you map that on the phylogeny, it gets even more complicated. Um, so this long trap, this long linear mandible evolved at least three times independently. And then this short trap, this short uh, 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 mandible uh, trap jaw evolved three to seven times directly from the gripping mandible and four times from shortening of that long trap jaw mandible. So it's a very complex pattern, but the, the sort of upshot is you get all these different forms in each region. So the endpoint has been the, the same from evolution and dispersal around the world. So looking at the function, actually the, the closing duration, the red are the trap jaws and the gray are the gripping, you can see orders of magnitude change, about eight orders of magnitude change in the maximum acceleration. And here we're just plotting maximum acceleration against mass um, of all kinds of different parts. Like some of you may know the, the mantis shrimp, the striking mantis shrimp. It's super slow, actually. It's really pathetic. So it's actually um, a very low acceleration. The Strumogenes trap giant is the fastest acceleration of any resettable part, any part that you can, you know, there are some explos explosive things that go faster, but anything you can put back, uh, they're, they're the highest. And, you know, many orders of magnitude higher acceleration than the gripping mandible. So over a million Gs in acceleration um, in that mandible. And the, the duration is 5,000 times faster than the blink of an eye that it'll close. So it's incredibly fast. And actually, it's studied, the, these kind of ultra-fast mechanisms are studied by roboticists and things who want to be able to generate really, really, really fast speeds. So whenever we find that this kind of convergent evolution, we want to ask, did they solve the problem the same way? Um, and in other systems, you know, if you find some pathway of stepping stones of continuing, continuous, uh, continuum of forms, you can better understand uh, how that, something that complex can emerge. And when we looked across the globe at these 450 species, we also found continuous variation in nearly every uh, uh, trait that, that constituted this, this, this trap jaw. And I'll just show a little video that helped us to understand how this could have evolved from this more gripping Form. So this, this is the ancestral form, and there's this structure in the middle that will be modified to the latch, but th this is how it moved ancestrally. It moves out of the way, and then the mandible closes. And it, but you happen to see these little nubbins here. So we, we found what, what is basically like a, uh, almost like a primitive trap job that just had a very, very slight realignment of that structure and little pockets forming in the labrum. And now the, that changes the, the function of the mandible. So it starts to catch on this uh, structure, Hold on. it starts to catch, and now the labrum in the middle controls closure. You pull it out of the way. And then after that change happens, you start to see big reorganizations in the head. It migrates back. This is a 90-degree version. Um, and then it can go all, even wider to a 180-degree version. They, they lose their teeth, usually. And then even to a 270 degree was the widest we found. And then in many cases, you in different clades, as I mentioned, you get a shortening from the long to the uh, short mandible trap jaw. This is a short mandible 180 degree opening. And uh, it, it even down to a 90 degree. 
So that helped us to understand. When, when you see that, it, it kind of makes more sense how this could have evolved many, many times. It was just a small realignment that changed the, the function of the mandible. And after that function changed, then you know, selection starts to shape it and optimize it and improve its function. When you see that, you can see how it may have evolved many different times. So we might call this, quote unquote, deterministic evolution. And here, you know, I think the three keys in this case were selection for speed. We know that there was selection for fast mandibles. Even the non-trap jaw mandibles are the fastest uh, known mandibles that don't have a power amplification mechanism. It was the presence of that structure that not all ants have that was ready to be adapted. And also this continuous anatomical pathway of functional stepping stones that connected what were, you know, in first look, very, very different phenotypes. And just to mention, there's been a lot of follow-up from this in our lab. Uh, Gaurav, one of my students, is doing work on the, um, the genomics of this in collaboration with Gene Myers, uh, uh, and where we're trying to understand on a, mo on a molecular level what is actually changing to reshape these phenotypes. Um, and there's, there, there's a lot there, but I can't go into it. And also others in the lab, lead Leonardo, have been looking at the development of the trap jaw. Um, and also Ryu is looking at the behavior and how that's correlated with, uh, with morphology. But I didn't yet answer the question, so okay, I showed you a lot of maybe some cool stuff, but I didn't say how can we generate the phenotype across this broad diversity of insects? You know, how can we apply a method like this to that? And one thing that we've been working with our, our collaborators in Germany, Germany is on high throughput synchrotron imaging. So to do what we can do here at OIST in our CT scanner, but take 16 hours to do that uh, and on a matter of 30 seconds of scan time is what you can do with a synchrotron. So just, and they've built a robotic pipeline to take advantage of this fast scan time and move uh, samples uh, in and out very quickly. So here you see uh, the robotics uh, uh, pipeline that's, this is an arm that's picking up a sample, it puts it in the, in the beam line there, it rotates it, takes a, a x-ray scan in all directions, picks it up and moves it. Takes about 30 seconds in each sample. Um, so, we take, so we started a project to take advantage of this we call AntScan. We've been, this is a, as you can see, a pandemic era project uh, that slowed us down a bit. But where we, we got collaborators all over the world to try to give us their specimen or donate their specimen and try to go through and just scan through a huge diversity of, of ants across the tree of life of ants. This was led by uh, Julian and, and Paco, who's now left in our lab, but everyone in our lab contributed in some way. Um, you can see here uh, when we had, uh, all these ants came here, they're prepared and loaded in the right kind of vials, and then they went to Germany to be scanned. Adrian and, Ju and Julian, who were the two Germans, were the only ones that could get in there and actually do the scanning at that time. Uh, so thankfully for them, we, we got the scanning done. And we were able to scan the red or, or all, the, all the different genera of ants that we were able to scan, including 238 that we intentionally worked with the genome projects where we have the scan, uh, the 3D scan, and we have the genome. So we, we can actually do, uh, pro, you know, data-based uh, projects that, that, that uh, ask about the genomic basis for different traits. And this is what you can get out of one single one of these scans if you put some time into it to actually segment out all the different parts of the ant. There's incredibly rich information in this uh, data. But it's not easy to, to get it out. That last image I showed you took a lot of uh, days of manual segmentation. So um, one project we've had with uh, Kenji Doya's lab is to try to build more automated methods to take all that data and digest it and extract features that we think are interesting, such as my uh, former PhD student who uh, made a method to detect the brain in the scan. So what we need to move ultimately is to be able to take apart an ant or any organism into all its different parts automatically without manual segmentation. We need sort of a new bioinformatics for that. Okay, so one of the, the more unexpected but fun uh, things we've done in the lab with this kind of data is just the new ways we have to interact with it. So um, once you get a, a, a digital uh, data set or a digital specimen, there's a lot of different places it can go. And here we built uh, online galleries. This is a, on a, a platform called Sketchfab. You can go on and, uh, and click on there and, and, and look at, uh, interact with 3D models in different ways. And I'd say that we have quite a lot of followers on there. They're basically not biologists. They're all like 3D animators and things. So they, because they, they are, our models are far more detailed than what you get with like 
Pixar or that kind of thing. So we get a lot of people, artists, who are re re requesting our data to do things with. Um, and we also, uh, and particularly uh, Masako, I don't know if she's here somewhere, but uh, has done a lot of work with our outreach in Okinawa. 3D printing answer is a really uh, a good way to get people to interact with it. Um, and also virtual reality. So um, I should thank Matthias for this too, because he also helped us uh, get this system set up. This is a workshop we had here. This is someone interacting in virtual reality with, with an ant that's about the size of a cow. And you can pick it up and move it around. And I can tell you, it really, uh, you know, is, um, it really is something when you can, you think it would just be fun, but actually you, when, you in, when you interact with something on your own scale, it can really uh, tap into some of your cognitive processing in a different way uh, uh, than, than, uh, than other ways. So the also augmented reality, we've done a lot of, some experiment with augmented reality, putting ants around the lab. And we even made for one of our, our groups uh, that we were just describing some new species, we built an actual augmented reality app, uh, iPhone app or iPad app, where you can open it and you can open the paper and the, 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 the models will pop out of the paper and you can interact with it. And just a quick story there, we had, uh, we originally were going to name them after Pokemon and uh, we had a Pokemon Go and we wrote this beautiful letter. I think from CPR helped us write this beautiful letter to, to, to Jiri san, the inventor of Pokemon, who started being an entomologist, saying, We're, We want to name these species after you, and all this. And we got back a letter from their lawyer saying, Do not do that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were going to name it after Pokemon. So what we did was we named them after this movie, Ready Player One, and some of the characters in Ready Player One. We didn't ask for permission uh, for that this time. But, um, but it, you know, part of it, this is kind of silly. But part of it is, is, is sort of more serious. So Ready Player One, you know, you may know it's this, this future world where everyone is living in augmented reality or in, in virtual reality in these online spaces. And many people think that at least part of our life will be, you know, we'll be interacting with each other and living and interacting in what you might call the metaverse. Uh, and, you know, in some ways this is a bit dystopian and uh, we're going to build all this uh, 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 this sort of artificial world where we're going to live, but it's also a bit of an opportunity. And I'm kind of obsessed with the idea that we need to get real biodiversity into this metaverse. And what you get from these 3D scans with a little effort, you can sort of take that. This is a morphologically perfect ant, you know, uh, that has been added some, some movement and some color to animate it. And uh, by my colleague, uh, Thomas Van de Kamp, who does this as a hobby, this is another ant from our ant scan data. So now we, we, we scan thousands of ants, and uh, we, um, uh, you know, this gives us, combining with all this geographic data, this 3D data, and other kinds of data, it gives us a foundation for a kind of di digital twin of Earth's biodiversity. I would like to be able to go in and interact with and see any species around the world uh, online. So I do think it's actually an opportunity, too, for people like me who care about biodiversity to create new ways for people to interact with it. And, you know, the... The thing about ant scan, you might say, okay, well, you scan 2,000 ants, you know, so what? Well, yeah, it is so what, but that's the point. If we scan 2,000 ants in one week, that means we can actually scale that up and scan millions of, of insect species, right, and capture them all di digitally. So that's uh, um, pretty exciting. So, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bear with me. I've got a lot of people to thank now. So, uh, um, but first of all, I want to thank everyone who's been in my lab over the years. I really, really tried to get everyone on there. Um, but uh, if I miss anyone from any of these slides, I, I am really sorry. But everyone in my lab, PhD students, uh, have been great. The researchers and staff, many visitors that we've had through the, and interns have been really critical. And I want to especially thank uh, Chisa. I don't know, uh, Chisa's here somewhere, but has been an incredible you know, uh, uh, person to help our lab keep going. She's the RUA for our unit. And even to the point where I would say she reads my mind, but actually she reads like my future mind, like things I haven't <laughs> even thought of yet, uh, that, but I'm gonna think of later. So she uh, uh, it has been uh, a critical member of the unit. But of course, all the work I showed was the work of, of many, many, many people. And I've been privileged to work with all the people who've come through the lab. I also want to thank everyone from the, the Faculty Affairs Office. So, um, I mean, I really thought when I became dean, uh, how, you know, I was worried, how am I going to be able to manage all these people? I don't know most of them or everything. But actually, this, this has been the real easy part. Um, everyone has been totally great, a great team. And uh, I'm going to miss uh, working with all of you. 
And I also want to thank OIST. Um, you know, uh, OIST gave you know, me personally and, and many of us incredible, uh, incredible opportunities. And I want to thank the leadership over the years, both past and all the people that I've been working with in the last year and a half, two years, uh, um, starting with the president and the provost and deans who we work with very, very closely. Um, I really have enjoyed it. All my fellow faculty, oops, all my fellow faculty. So the, um, you know, I, my only regret is I couldn't collaborate with and interact with more of you because there's a lot of interesting stuff that we could do. Ho hopefully it's not too late in some cases. Um, all the, the staff here at OIST, um, the core facilities, but especially these four, all this work, I mean, could not have happened without the core facilities that we have here. That's really key to understand. I mean, we, I, the best thing we can say is we, we did things to take advantage of the opportunities here, but it was really the opportunities from you know, the ESI section, the imaging section, uh, at SCDA and, and the sequencing that allowed us to do some of these projects. BFM, CPR, and especially the people listed up there, but, but many, many people who are not. I wanna thank all of you. And I want to thank my family, and I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> but uh, the, I want to especially thank uh, my family because they have sacrificed a ton, you know, in order for me to be able to do stuff and for us to do stuff together, and particularly the, the last two years. And I want to thank my wife because, you know, she really, you know, had to cover a lot of weekends and nights and time that I was doing things as dean or even before that uh, as professor. So. Uh, really would not have been possible if it were not a team effort. So thank you for that. Okay, almost, almost done. So I'm headed to the University of Maryland in case you don't know where that is. That's sort of in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., the, ca the, uh, the capital. Please, if you want to come visit, you're welcome. If you're in Washington, D.C., there's a lot of conferences there. Uh, come up and stop by and see us. Um, you may want to come before November, before they put all the professors in jail. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, but anyway, yeah, I hope to see you there uh, at some point. Finally, Nife Deberu to the people of Okinawa and Japan for supporting OIST and supporting this incredible project. I really cannot thank all of you enough. I feel like tremendous gratitude and also, you know, to all of you, you know, I hope you can zoom out and recognize you're really part of a very special project. There's a lot of, you know, it's not an easy project. There's a lot of tough things that we have to deal with, but I truly believe OIST is a unique project around the world, and we're privileged to be a part of it. And, um, you know, it's going to be two steps forward, one step back on a lot of things. Uh, it certainly has been the last 12 years. But, um, but I, I will always cherish being involved with this, and I hope I can continue to be involved with this. And uh, yeah, I just want to thank the people of Japan and Okinawa for taking a chance on such a crazy, ambitious thing. So thank you, and that's all I have. Yeah. Thank you very much, Evan, for the great talk. Uh, I'm told we have about 10 minutes for questions, so I'm sure there must be some. <laughs> Can I ask one, just to get things started? You talked about seasonal variation in insect numbers and synchronization across different species and how that worked much better in the forests than outside. So why, what drives that? Yeah, that's a great question. So. The answer, I forgot to say this, but the answer is we don't know. And uh, um, that would be the next step. So there, you know, of course could be, have to do, the most obvious thing would be the thermal environment, but also could have to do with the, the availability of other food sources, like other insects. Um, but there's a lot of ecological things that, that may need to get unpacked to really understand that. Um, but it's also something that because of the way surveys work, Almost no one has looked for that around the world in this kind of subtropical areas. Um, so, uh, yeah, that would be, uh, that's a great question, and, um, yeah, we need to work on that to figure that out. So would it be fair to say that the synchronization tells you about relationships, but not how those relationships work? Yeah, it, it, it may not be a direct relationship, because it could be relationships 
between independent things with another thing. But uh, the um, but yeah, exactly what's going on there is unclear. Now whether that generalizes across many other groups, not just ants. Okay, so questions. Yeah. I'm, Amy's closest. Um, so Evan, great talk. I have a question uh, for the uh, the trap jaw, yeah. the mechanical part. If I understand that correctly, you're saying, so when the species, when they kind of uh, change their mechanical mechanism, they can also, uh, con as a consequence, they change the phenotype, or it's the other way around? Well, it's, so w that those, maybe I should have been more clear, that morphing I was showing you uh -huh. was across different species. So we're talking about what's happening over millions of years of evolution. Okay. So it doesn't necessarily happen in that, in so the, the, all those sequences, mm -hmm. but um, but basically, what what you, you if you when you start, you have two very different things that have very different shapes, and totally, it's hard to see how that could one could have evolved to, to the other. But what we were able to find is sort of a case where the morphology was very very similar, but the function had changed. Right, of the different parts are doing diff different things, and once you change the function, now different mu muscles control the closure or the latch then the morphology can really re-optimize around that uh, okay. new function, if uh -huh. that makes sense. So it's not that it changes in its, uh, in its one species, Oh, okay. So it, it, it takes, yeah, so, so what's the time scale, you know, from right. kind so of that one generation to, to the next? Well, the generation time may be small, like a few years, but the, the whole evolutionary branching where you went from an ancestor to over a thousand species, that took about 37 million years. Okay. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think we had some questions from the side of the room, so maybe when we'll come back. Do you want to get the mic? So great talk, Evan. That's really spectacular. It's like, I have a question on the convergent evolution yeah. aspect of mm -hmm. this whole thing. I mean, normally in evolution, you don't see convergent evolution at a molecular level. Right. It's all divergent and things like that. But when things are very close, Occasionally, you'll see some signature or convergent evolution. Since these are all ants, they have the same mechanism. Do you see any yeah. any convergent evolution at the genetic level that actually allow you to do something? And nowadays, because of, you know, is there some way to, you know, prove it genetically? Yeah. So the the um, so just just first of all, I'll, I want to answer that on the morphological level, and that is that, you know. I showed you that first that it's evolved four times across very distantly related ants. So ants that are 100 million years, you know, diverge from each other. And that, in that case, you had a similar function, but they always made the latch out of something different. So they, they would, all the different parts would be something else being co-opted. But within this, this one group that we studied where you had seven to 10 additional evolutions, it was always the, the same parts being modified. So that are already, you know, supports what you said. Now, Garov, uh, somewhere here, um, there, no, where is he, I don't know. Okay, yeah, there he is, behind a mask. Um, he, he, he's been doing his PhD on this question of the molecular, uh, and so, and with Gene, they've sequenced really, really high quality genomes, um, Gene Myers, uh, really, really high quality genomes. So the first thing they've looked at is the protein coding regions. At our, is evolution accelerated in a convergent way in when you, whenever you get this trap evolved, you see the same genes evolving faster, which could indicate that there's something going on functionally. Nothing, no signal of the trap jaw. But he's also looking at uh, conserved uh, non-coding element exons, right? So CNEs. So these are the parts that regulate the expression of other of the coding regions. I'm just saying for other people, I know you know that. Uh, but the, and and we do see preliminary evidence that there's a um, that that there are more convergent accelerations, not necessarily the same base pairs changing, but that you get accelerated evolution in, in the same genes, in the same regions that modify the same genes. So that in itself is still suggestive, of course, to go, to really prove that, you have to go and figure out what that thing is doing and manipulate it and actually see. But that has been done in other groups. Um, so that would be the, the next step down the line to try to understand the, the mechanistic basis of the convergent evolution, but we're not there yet. Thanks. I think there was another question here. Thanks. The, genetic, the genetics underlying those morphological changes, are they generally highly polygenic, or are there roles for major genetic change, major individual loci? So in Peter and Rosemary Grant and the Darwin Finches, we see both in the sticklebacks, 
of Dolph Luter, we see both. Yep. Do you guys have preliminary results about that? I don't think we have data that can say that one way or the other, right? Uh, would you agree with me, Gaurav? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. It, so there, there's the most obvious thing is the mandible, but there's also changes to the musculature. There's changes to the nervous system. There's a lot of different changes going on. So in that sense, it must be polygenic. But the, um, but in terms of actually pinpointing or saying, can we change something that would all of a sudden give you a trap jaw? I think we're still quite a ways away from that. Yeah. Okay. So I think we have a question here. In your map of the global bi biodiversity, there was sort of a clear bio boundary visible between the United States and Canada. This can't just be the temperature, I guess. Right? The amount of data points in, in Canada were much less. Can you explain mm. that? Oh, no. Okay, so that is that, that's not the border of Canada. And yeah, so it was earlier, that, but that, it's that's all right. That's actually <laughs> a climatic feature, yeah. Okay. So, climatic um, feature. So yeah, Canada's got data. We're, it's uh, actually, <laughs> they don't have many ants, but they have a lot of data. They're Canadian. <laughs> um, they don't have many ant species. Yeah. Um, but that, that is a, it's, I mean, you do see sometimes political things where, this is actually sampling, um, yeah. Anyway, there, you do see sometimes political lines, but in these, I don't think it really shows up um, that much. Uh, we've drawn the border there, but actually, you do get a very steep gradient of species richness in when, when, once you get above sort of southern Canada because of the, the harsh environment. The harsh environment, okay. And, uh, that's true in many groups. Yeah, I guess um, going forward, um, what now? Like, how are you going to continue, you know, pursuing these similar research themes, or are you thinking of doing something else? You know, this would be a job interview. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I think, you know, uh, it's a really tough question that I've been in the very small amount of free brain space I have uh, thinking about lately. But, you know, one thing is, if I think back to what I talked about that I said I was going to do when everyone was sleeping because they were tired, in my job talk, I, you know, it's, it's quite different than what I ended up doing. And the reason is because I feel that I really tried to take advantage of the opportunities here, the very unique strengths and weaknesses that OIST has, okay? So, and try to use its strengths to, you know, compensate somewhat for the, for the weaknesses. So, I won't go into detail, but I, I so yeah, it's tough for me, because I don't know if I should just try to pick up everything and replicate it somewhere else. That's probably not the best strategy, right? Just to try to find out what? So I have some ideas of things I would like to get into that I might be able to better there that were hard to do here. Um, but, you know, uh, but yeah, it's going to be challenging to, to sort that out. So ask me in a year, and hopefully I'll have a better idea for it. Yeah. I think we move on to the, the next bit, which apparently is on me. Evan, we would like to say thank you. And a, a plaque has been fabricated. Uh, um, I was asked to, to come up with some words for this and thought, oh my, that's difficult. So, so long and thanks for all the fish is already taken. And if I'd said anything with ants, Evan would probably hit me. So <laughs> what I did was to read a bunch of Evan's recent papers and see what struck me. And what I felt was really that he'd appreciated that all of the data describing life forms a kind of ecosystem too. And that was a really, really smart thing to understand. Maybe maybe life scientists will not think will think that was obvious, but it wasn't obvious to me. And I think that kind of sums up a lot of what Evans accomplished on the science side. Uh, thank you also for all that you've done for the university on the um, administrative leadership, everything barbecue, everything else side. <laughs>
because Juanita will also be leaving, and she's been with us for the same amount of time, and she's contributed through the SDG and through her very dedicated work with the CDC. There are a few people in the room, Gail is one, who knows how much she gave to that, so I think she also deserves a round of applause. Now, if I've understood my brief correctly, I should now hand the microphone over to Heather. You're going to use the podium. Okay, so I can retreat. Um, in communications, we have the privilege of talking about the value of OIST through stories of great research and compelling people. So thank you so much, Evan, for giving us such amazing stories over the years. Um, we, Tomomi, made you a card and we all signed it. 